Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus channel. It wasn't long after the invention of the airplane that military strategists began to see the value of essentially dropping troops behind enemy lines. The United States established its first airborne or paratrooper unit, the 501st Parachute Infantry Battalion, in 1940. This was just in time for World War II, when airborne units would prove critical in a number of major campaigns. Because they can so easily infiltrate large areas, they can secure key objectives, disrupt enemy defenses, and even carry out secret missions on behalf of their forces. To this day, the United States operates several airborne divisions based all around the world. Perhaps one of the most famous military operations in history was Operation Overlord, also known as D-Day. The assault took place on June 6, 1944, and involved more than 150,000 soldiers storming the beaches in Normandy, France. The United States was one of the Allied nations engaged in the operation and American paratroopers were part of the airborne assault that preceded the amphibious landings on the beaches of Normandy. The paratroopers were dropped behind enemy lines, where they were tasked with securing critical strategic locations like bridges and causeways, while doing what they could to disrupt enemy communications. D-Day is considered one of the most important military attacks ever attempted. And the United States military, along with its World War II allies, has gone to great lengths to honor the legacy of the men who fought and died. In Picoville, France, there is a memorial commemorating the U.S. airmen assigned to the 9th Air Force and U.S. Army paratroopers assigned to the 82nd and 101st Airborne Division, who lost their lives during multiple plane crashes during the D-Day operation. Nearly as iconic as the paratroopers themselves are the aircraft that help them perform their death-defying duties. Among the most common platform for these operations are the C-130 Hercules, the C-17 Globemaster, the CH-47 Chinook helicopter, and the V-22 Osprey. Of course, in some cases, paratroopers may have to make do with a wide range of other aircraft types. Even a physically fit person can't go straight from never having jumped out of a plane before to doing so perfectly. That's why one of the first procedures that new recruits go through is proper landing and egress training. At Fort Bragg, North Carolina, home to the 82nd Airborne Division and 18th Airborne Corps, this process starts on an obstacle course known as Ground School. The new paratroopers learn about proper body positioning during the jump, emergency procedures, and the importance of safety measures. They'll also be shown how to safely enter and exit an aircraft, prepare for the jump, and communicate effectively with the aircrew during the flight. The 
The most important technique of all is the parachute landing fall, which helps absorb the impact and minimize the risk of injury upon landing. The ground school also includes comprehensive training on the theory, equipment, and procedures involved in parachute operations, including the different types of chutes and all the various components of a parachute system. As they progress through the course, the paratroopers will gradually work their way up from jump tower training to actual jumps from an aircraft. The first jumps are typically made from a lower altitude and with a static line system, which automatically deploys the parachute upon exiting the aircraft. This adds another layer of safety to prevent accidents and injuries. Training lasts for several weeks at least, but eventually the paratroopers will graduate and be deployed. Most training culminates with a final exercise that puts everything they've learned so far to the test. We've been uh, doing the intensive training cycle for the last five weeks. And this is the final event, Friday night. You guys get done with this and uh, they'll be trained up, ready to go. They've got to get through the aerosol. Everybody gets excited, gets amped up. And then, okay, that phase is done. Now we got to move. We get through the movement, react to contact, complete that. Then they go through with the complex wire obstacle, going through the bunker positions, fighting positions. Scenarios like this often include detailed special effects and accurately simulate the sorts of problems an airborne team might encounter on a mission. Instructors also time each unit as they complete the course so that they can identify any areas of improvement. When it comes time to initiate an actual jump, Paratroopers must follow a very detailed process specifically designed to ensure every single one lands safely. A large cargo aircraft like the C-17 can carry up to 102 paratroopers at once. So it's imperative that every one of these men and women pays close attention to orders and procedures. For the uh, hand signals, it's going to be standard. So for time, anything like that, we're on the ground. You're here three Before the jump, one, the paratroopers will receive briefings on the mission objectives, review safety procedures, and do a gear check. This not only ensures they have the necessary equipment, but it gives them a chance to check that their parachutes are properly packed and in good working condition. Depending on the type of aircraft, they may sit on benches along the sides or secure themselves to static lines in the cargo area. For safety reasons, they will remain seated and connected to the aircraft until it reaches the designated drop zone. After final safety checks, the jump master will review the jump plan, including the exit sequence, formation in the air, and actions upon landing. Once the aircraft is over the drop zone, the jump master gives the order to egress. At this point, the paratroopers stand up, move towards the open door or exit point, and hook themselves to a static line that will automatically deploy their chute the moment they're free of the aircraft.
Even all the preparation in the world can't completely eliminate accidents. In fact, Army and Air Force medics train extensively in how to treat injuries sustained by paratroopers during a fall. The most common injuries during these types of operations are broken legs. But it's not uncommon for paratroopers to suffer much more severe casualties. In any case, a good outcome relies on the medics providing treatment as quickly as possible. Paratroopers are trained to perform their duties in a wide range of environments. In order to ensure they know how to adapt to factors like extreme heat and extreme cold, the U.S. military and its allies have set up a variety of annual and biannual exercises. One example is Arctic Warrior a military training exercise focusing on cold weather and Arctic warfare operations. Based at Fort Wainwright, Alaska, Arctic Warrior includes everything from live fire exercises and small unit tactics to convoy operations, combat patrols, and paratrooper jumps. The cold can dramatically affect both equipment and the human body, so special precautions are taken to ensure each jump is a success. Uh, today is, uh, is a, an Arctic uh, jump. We're doing an airborne operation, jumping with all of our Arctic equipment uh, as we continue to build our proficiency at operating to include jumping into any environment in the world. So uh, today we're jumping with skis, snowshoes, uh, in our overwhites, as we are building proficiency to do operations in the Arctic Circle later this winter. As with any other jump, medics will be standing by to ensure that they can provide swift aid to any injured paratroopers. However, Snowmobiles are the best way to render assistance in this Arctic environment. During exercise swift response in Lake Altavatni, Norway, soldiers and medics practice using these vehicles to recover paratroopers from the field and get them safely back to base. This sometimes involves using a special stretcher equipped with skis that the snowmobiles can pull more easily in snowy conditions. Despite the danger inherent in their jobs, many military paratroopers participate in public events. They may jump out of planes at air shows, the Super Bowl, or other major occasions with nothing to do with their military service. In these cases, the goal is to demonstrate their capabilities to the public. Perhaps the best known parachuting team is the Leapfrogs. Officially known as the Navy Parachute Team, these men perform aerial displays and jumps at air shows, public events, and military ceremonies nationwide. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.